three or four examples, but that'll be it. OK, depends on if we can get through the stuff that I want to today. So let's try to wrap this up, which I think we're pretty good. All right, first of all, guys, if you remember, first thing that I talked about every single time I asked, is the function continuous? Is the function continuous? Every single problem we've done, I say, first thing I say, is the function continuous? Right? And each and every time, the function has been continuous, right? So in this example, we do not have a continuous function. Now, that is important because that if we don't have a continuous function, that means we have an asymptote or a hole. Obviously, you guys know that this is an asymptote. But then we don't have a local max or min at that value, right? It still can be a critical value, but it's not going to be a max or a min, right? Would you guys agree with me? But could we also have increasing, decreasing, like changing values? Like here's our asymptote. Couldn't, we, couldn't the graph like be changing from increasing to decreasing, though? Right? So it is possible. I mean, asymptotes, it also, um, it also could be increasing on both intervals. Right? So we just got to be kind of a, a little bit aware of what's happening now that we have an asymptote. So anyways, my recommendation, or at least what I would do, is I'll just write asymptote x equals 0. So I don't forget, because you're going to forget, especially when you're taking a test and you have so many other things going on in your brain. Things like Little things like this um, are what they like to assess. The next thing is I hate using the quotient rule. I make mistakes using the quotient rule. So what I'm going to do is simply rewrite this as the product rule. OK? I don't want to use the quotient rule. And if I go ahead and simplify this, um, remember you're going to add the power. So that's going to be a negative x squared minus x to the negative second. Do you guys see the math, at least, that I completed to get to that point? No? So I distributed x to the negative second times x to the negative to x to the fourth. Remember, when you multiply exponents, you what do you do what with the powers? Add them. So 4 plus negative 2 is just 2. And then x times negative 1 is just negative x. And then negative, and obviously, it just remains negative 2. So now, when I go ahead and find my derivative, where'd the what come from? What x? It is. It's not. The, x doesn't come negative. The power is negative. Oh, you're saying about the negative. Yeah. So I distributed the negative to the numerator. You're saying, should you distribute it to both? OK, so let me bring you to this question. 4 divided by negative 2 is equal to negative 4 divided by negative 2, which is equal to negative 4 over 2, but is not equal to negative 4 over negative 2. So when you have a negative in front, you either put it to the denominator or to the numerator. When you have a negative in front, you either put it to the denominator or the numerator, but you never put it to both. Because a negative over a negative is now positive. So it didn't matter which one you want to do. You could distribute it to the numerator or denominator, but you have to pick one. And it doesn't matter which one you pick. All right, into my derivative. So I have negative 2x um, plus x to the negative third, right? No? Yes? Okay. Which I could rewrite as uh, negative 2x plus, x, oops, plus a 1 over x cubed. Guys, if I want to get common denominators, my common denominator is going to be, say, for my blue girl. Who stole my blue? Common denominator would be x cubed. x cubed, right? Thank you. Somebody's here. I didn't know if I was teaching myself or I have people in this class. So therefore, I'll multiply by x cubed on both. And now I can say f prime of x is equal to a negative 2x to the fourth plus 1 over x cubed. Yes? I don't know. What did I do? Oh, I forgot to put, I forgot to take the two, right? I forgot to bring down the two, which is a 
positive two, thank you. So that would have been a two over here, right? Thank you. Power rule mistake, right? So it doesn't really matter, I guess, if you change. You can still make mistakes. Um, but then we agree with this, right? OK. Now, again, what did we remember? Critical values on the first derivative test are when the derivative is equal to 0 or undefined, right? And or does not exist. Well, look it. Hey, what is our undefined value here? 0. zero. But, but going back to our original function, what was 0? An asymptote. So this, even though it's a critical, even though it's a critical value, right? Per se, it's not in the domain, right? So it's technically not a critical value, unlike our first derivative test, because it's not in the domain. Do you guys understand that? This is the first time we've dealt with this. The first time we've dealt with this. It's undefined in the derivative. Okay, fine. But it's undefined in the original function. So it's not, it's, you know, it's not going to be a max or a min. Okay? But it is still a critical value, so we still have to use testing intervals on it. Because if I was saying, is it increasing or decreasing, we'd have to know increasing or decreasing from what. Um, all right, so if I want to set this equal to 0, you guys would agree with me that I could just do a little uh, cheap work here. Factor out of 2 and just set the numerator equal to 0. I don't need to worry about the, numer uh, the denominator. That's actually the fourth. Yes? I could go ahead and solve here. Um, divide by 2 on both sides would give you still 0. So I'd have 0 equals x to the fourth minus 1. Now you could do this a couple different ways. You could add a 1 and take the fourth root. But remember, the fourth root is even. So just like the square root, you have to do plus or minus. Or you could also factor using difference of two squares. x squared minus 1 times x squared plus 1. Well, guys, x squared plus 1 is going to give you two complex zeros. So that actually is not going to be, we're not testing complex numbers or imaginary numbers, right? So we're only going to really test x squared minus 1 equal to 0, which is still just going to give us x equals plus or minus 1. So we go into our table, x and f prime. So we have our testing intervals, which are at negative 1, 0, and at 1. Why are we including 0? It is a critical value, guys. It is. It's just not in the domain. So sometimes you could also like just put some little things here to make sure you remember percent. That's an asymptote. Sometimes I'd even write in. Asymptote. Don't forget. It's an asymptote. It's not actually a, a relative max or min. Write an asymptote. Draw a dashed line. Whatever you need to do to remember. It's not, a, it's not defined in the function. So let's go and pick a point to the left of negative 1. Let's pick negative 2. Between negative 1 and 0, let's just pick 1 half. Between 0 and 1, let's just pick 1 half. Greater than 1, let's just pick 2. OK? Um, now again, the, ba the best thing to understand when you're plugging them into this function is understand what the sign and when the sign is preserved or when the sign is not preserved. Remember, guys, any time you're taking a number, raising it to the even power, it's always going to be positive. But then we're always multiplying it by negative 2, so it's always going to be a negative value. And then anything to the third power is always going to preserve the sign. So if it's a negative to the third power, it's negative. If it's positive to the third power, it's positive. All right, so let's do negative 2. So when I plug in negative 2, I get a positive times a negative, which is a negative number, which is way larger than positive 2. Don't you guys agree with me? That's way larger than positive. Like that's 2 to the fourth power is going to be, what, 16? So that's like 16 times 2, so that's negative 32 plus 2 is negative 30. And then this is obviously always going to be negative. So you have a negative over a negative, which is positive. Are you guys following with me, or do I need to show a little bit more work? You guys are OK? So let's go into negative 1, or that's negative 1 half. Sorry about that. Um, so if I did a negative 1 half, I might want to visualize this a little bit more. So I'll kind of write this on, because positive 1 half is going to be kind of the same thing. So, so let's do negative 1 half. So that'd be negative 2 times uh, negative 1 half to the fourth is going to be now a positive 1 16th plus 2 over um, 1 eighth. OK, so this is really negative 1 eighth, which is smaller than 2. So that becomes a positive. 
Oops, I'm sorry, that's a negative, right? Do you guys agree with me? That's negative 1 8th, which is smaller than 2, right? So that means anything smaller than 2, which is positive, that's going to be a positive over a negative, which is negative. So now, if I just change these to negative terms, if I now just plug this into a negative, does this still remain positive? Yes. So now this changes to a positive. So a positive 1 half, I'm now at a positive. And then if I plug in 2, 2 is the exact same thing as we did before. This is some large negative number over some large positive number. So that turns into a negative. Okay. So now, if we're going to, again, write our extrema here, we're going to say f has a relative max. OK, so again, we're going positive to negative, so that's a max. And positive to negative, right there is a max. Yes? Did you just write both of those in this statement? Yep. Yes, but you can't, do not write the max and the min in the same statement because it's important. You have to state po, you're going from positive to negative or are you going from negative to positive. So yes, we can include both of them. S has a relative max at x equals um, negative 1 and x equals 1 since f prime of x changes from positive to negative at x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. Right? But where is the mistake that people make here? People say at 0 there's a min. Because it makes sense. I mean, it, it, if you're just following, the, if you're just doing the, you know, operations like we've been doing, it would make sense for that to be a min. But as long as you intuitively understand, that can't be a min because it's an asymptote of the graph. You can't have a minimum value at an asymptote, right? That makes sense? Doesn't make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. And then obviously, guys, we could do increasing, decreasing values, but I'll save you a little bit of the time to go from there. Yes? Um, so, why did we test? We didn't test zero. Yeah, so it's still a critical value. Like, for instance, if I want, like, all right, no, fine. What if I was, I also did say find increase and decrease in intervals. So, you know what? Let's just continue. F is increasing. It's not being you, it's just me being thorough. F is being increasing on what intervals? Well, this is a. Continue, this is a continuous graph. There's no closed interval. So it's going to be from negative, inf let's do it over here, negative infinity to negative 1, and then from union 0 to 1. Right? So if we didn't use 0, though, we wouldn't know what was happening to the left or to the right. Does that kind of make sense? Because wouldn't you agree, if you've left out 0, look what's happened here. At 0, it's changing. Right? So it's important because if you just would have tested, if you just would have left that out and said, I'm just going to test between negative 1 and 0 and 1, and you just chose one test point, you would say, oh, it's only negative between these two. That's wrong. It's actually it's changing at 0. Right? So that's why that's important. Okay? And then f is decreasing. And it's decreasing from negative 1 to 0, union 1 to infinity. All right, that is, ladies and gentlemen,